back for another edition of the Body Beauty Show. Today's episode is brought to you by these three pots of coffee uh, I have slammed today. And uh, Tyler's <laughs> barber, whose hair is better than mine. Tyler, thanks for being hey. on today. How are you? How are you? Good, good. <laughs> yeah, big shout out to Mia Garcia in Idaho Falls, Idaho. She does good work, that lady. I tell you what. So, <laughs> Hey, go see her. If you're yeah. listening to the podcast, again, Tyler's hair is... The joke was before we started, uh, Tyler, this is not a rock band audition because you're looking like you're on tour, <laughs> like a rock star. But, uh, anyway. Yeah. Very cool. Well, here we are, Tyler. I'm glad to have you on today. This is going to be a different flavor of uh, shows because you are essentially an educator. You run the Austin, yeah. am I saying this correctly? Austin CAD Academy. Cade. Cade. Yep, Austin okay. Cade Academy. Yep, yep. So that's Interesting. Us. Yeah. I think as a uh, as an anchor setter here, give us a brief synopsis of how the academy came to be and how you found yourself in this world because you're not by training an esthetician etc no no it was a, a point in life where <clears throat> after 9-11 life had not treated my wife and I fair financially and we had to fight and claw and scratch like a lot of people at that time uh, bad economy yada 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 give you all the excuses but ultimately, she helped uh, a very good friend of our, Larry, Larry Curtis, start uh, his school first of Taylor Andrews, and he's opened uh, multiple since, but uh, helped him start his uh, dream. And then she needed her dream. And we moved back to small town Idaho and opened up uh, Austin Kate Academy. We were broke at the time, like, like broke, broke, like, you know, 12 bucks in the bank account with four kids broke. And found some money and the name of Austin Cade comes from Austin's our son and Cade was our original investors uh, uh, son's name and and uh, 2008 during a really down economy we opened a trade school and and have been fighting ever since uh, got to the point where we were accredited and you know never looked back it's been it's been good ever since so I'm in this industry because of my wife and I you know we've been uh, married uh, going on it's either 32 or 33. I mean, you kind of lose track at some point, but you <laughs> you you really love the person, but it's like, wait, how long have we been together? Because I've been married longer than I've been not married at this point. So, wow. but yeah, that's how, how I got involved was, you know, she wasn't saying, hey, should we go do this thing? She, Allison, my wife was like, hey, I'm going to go open a school. And the train was leaving the, the, the station and either I jump on board or, uh, or, or get left behind. And I decided to jump on board and it's been a good, it's been a good mix. Uh, I, I handle my portion of the school. She handles her portion of the school. And, and in that we developed a, you know, a solid business cur curriculum, very solid craft curriculum. And we've been putting people out to, to earn money in their chosen profession, uh, since 2008. So 14 years, yep. 11 months. Yep. To be precise. Yes, yeah, coming up. Wow. Yeah, coming up. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. So there's there's a few things that jump to mind here before we get into the uh uh the entree of today's episode, let's say. So here's some appetizers. The first observation, and I didn't realize this when I first spoke to you, Tyler, is that you started this academy in the bowels of oh. one of the worst recessions to date. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in our, in our lifetime, I mean, you, when you yeah. look back at in the seventies, when we had no gas or we had parts of the United States that didn't even have gasoline that you could get on a regular basis. People were buying homes at 20% interest. I still put 2008 to 2013 ahead of, or, you know, in, in terms of being a loser, I think that that time frame to start a business was a terrible idea, but when you're broke, you're broke. And what are you going to do? And And we got after it. So. So the reason this is, so we're going to book in today's show by mistake in a good way with, yeah. this is going to be a hope, which is the point. Yeah. I hope, I hope so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so here's why. So the, this first observation is that, okay, so 14 years ago, dang near 15 years ago, you started the Academy, which has gone on to clearly sustain you for 15 years and probably provide a lifestyle that you enjoy and meaning and meaning and meaning, right? Yeah. Victor Frankel, Man Search for Meaning, et cetera. But you started this at what is arguably, from the um, the prima facie point of view, 
the worst time you could possibly start a business. Uh, Why do I mention that? Well, the money printer at the Fed is going worm. President Powell, joke, LOL, is uh-huh. who's in control of the economy, is is in a really hellish pickle where a yeah. lot of different uh, inroads to this intersection seem to be presenting themselves all spelling either we are in a recession or we're about to face a recession could join with a nice little healthy dose of um, contra to what the CPI clowns would say, hyperinflation potentially at some point as the money printers kick back on again. I mean, who Uh knows? The MMTs would say otherwise. But regardless, the point is we're on the precipice, it seems, of a recessionary environment that might flatten people that are not looking at the – the upcoming, if not already current, recessionary environment through the lens of an opportunist. So the point I'm making is that where everyone's zigging and uh, swimming into fear and panic, the message for today to start the show off is let's let's find ways to reframe our thinking so that we can be optimists and find ways to prosper in times of what could be for me and will be for many despair. So I want to start with that as the anchor today. Any thoughts? Yeah, about that? boy, I I could talk for about an hour on that. Uh, I'll tell you that much right now. But but you're right. I mean, they were <clears throat> they had held interest rates so low for so long that our money really didn't have any value. It was the only thing that they could do. No one likes the idea. Uh, I was talking to uh, I do this little thing in my Volkswagen Bug where I drive around with people, and I was doing it before the celebrity I won't name names was doing <laughs> his his show. But he is funnier and has cooler cars because I just have a '67 Bug. But I had this economist, and he was this was you know six eight months ago, and he was like, "They got to raise rates because our money's value really isn't there." So these homes, you know, you, you were buying a home in my neighborhood that. Uh, uh, 10 years prior was going for $75,000 was now going for uh, $350,000. And, and now that the interest rates have gone up, people have slowed down. Now, real estate investors are still on board. Uh, your VRBO people that are putting together their portfolio are still buying properties. Um, but the, the consumers slowing things down, which, which has its upside and downside, it has to level out or be uh, in a better spot than what it was because, you know, supply was not meeting demand. And because of that, we had this, uh, uh, overpricing in the industry, new construction was through the roof, all these things, supply chains are messed up on all sorts of levels. And, and so, yeah, we hate to see interest rates go up, but as I mentioned previously, just briefly, there was a time in the U S uh, history where people were buying homes at 20% interest. So now those homes were not six hundred thousand, a million, two million dollars, but but it you know it helped to kind of to curb that that hyper not just inflation but but cost of of products and slow it down. So I'm a big fan of government get out of the way, but you can't have free money and expect your money to have any value, and that's kind of what we were seeing. Um, now to the optimists out there, and and you got to be. Because you panic is what kills us. I mean, you look at when COVID hit, you know, at the time my dad had just passed away and he had fought uh, diabetes for a number of years. He made it to 80 and it was right before all the panic of COVID. So we were down at his funeral out of town. And when we came back, uh, my wife, Allison and I were going to the grocery store and there had been all this panic. And there was just big chunks of the grocery store gone that didn't have to be gone. It's just people needed to, to have their toilet paper, apparently, uh, more than they needed to have their fresh fruits and vegetables, though, because fresh fruits and vegetables were still there. So panic just created this huge issue for everyone. And so as, as we are going into, and I, I will say that it's time for a recession because they're cyclical, cyclical they just kind of come and go over periods of time, right? Uh, strong economies last longer than bad economies, but they just come and they go. So in, in the beauty space specific and in many spaces, you can insulate yourself if you don't panic and if you just get after it and work hard and, and there's there's going to be challenges. Absolutely, there's going to be challenges. So, But in the beauty space specific, whether the economy is good or bad, your clients still come for appointments. So you, it, it, but there's things that happen and you got to be aware of those things. And if you do, you can actually grow your business during a down economy where other industries and verticals are really struggling. 
we see our industry uh, uh, really thriving during a down economy because we don't focus on the fact that the economy sucks. We focus on the, on providing a great, useful service to the client and the client keeps coming back and the client keeps referring people to us and we grow our business. We give a little bit of added value during a down economy because your clients are feeling it too. And But it's that, that panic that is going to hurt the people staying calm and cool headed is where is where growth is going to happen. And I don't know that I really answered, but like I said, I could go <laughs> off on this because when people panic, I hate, I hate that. And, and again, we saw that in grocery stores and, and honestly that people that panicked and bought 10 years worth of toilet paper and not the right food, uh, you were going to die. And I was just going to walk into your house and get the toilet paper I needed because I had the right food, <laughs> you know, which, which is maybe kind of mean of me to say, but but when you're when you're panicked, you're not making the right decisions, and 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 we will see a downturn in the economy, uh, but it's where we get better. It's where industry gets better. We always have an answer, and our governments continue to screw it up, and and private industry always figures it out. And it and it might take us a second because of some of the constraints that they put on, on us at times, but we will always we will always figure it out. There's always the people out there that will say. Hey, here's actually the opportunity that, and they are the ones that aren't panicking. So mm. anyway, I, I, like I said, sometimes I just start <laughs> getting on my soapbox and not really going with a very solid thought, but how about that? Uh, d downturn in the economy, don't panic. <clears throat> and I don't care what industry you're in. You're going to be fine if you don't panic. So. A couple of things jump to mind. Uh, first is, are you, or do you have any, uh, affiliation family members or otherwise that are military trained or vets or anything of the sort? Yeah, my son-in-law was in the Air Force for two <laughs> tours. Uh, you know, I had a grandfather that was in something. He didn't ever go to face uh, the front or anything, but he, he did have a responsibility. But I think all of America had responsibilities during World War One, World War Two, anyway. But yeah. But yeah, my my uh, son in laws out of the Air Force now, but he was he was in the Air Force and deployed uh, uh, to, you know, even into uh, the Middle East for a period of time. So, OK, OK. So the reason I, I ask and thanks for sharing that is yeah. so I served in the Air Force for five years um, without getting into all the glorious or unglorious boring details. <laughs> um, <laughs> part of um, part of one of my areas of interest at the time while in was exploring the special operations uh, types and their training. And there's a really interesting um, TV show. It was, God, it was on years ago um, called surviving the cut. And it chronicles the stories of Rangers, seals, etc. And part of the training for those that are going to be aquatic or in the water at, at any point is, I think it's a part of the buds training that seals go through, but Rangers also go through it, et cetera. And the training um, that stood out that's relevant here to your point about don't panic is the buddy. It's <laughs> it's hysterically named. It's called buddy breathing. Yeah. It's one of the, yeah. and they may call it something different now, but the idea is, oh no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm getting these conflated. It's called drown proofing. And so what they do is they push you, you're in a pool, by the way. So this is where, you know, the, the, the saying is the pool is the great equalizer. I don't care if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger in your prime, or if you're a scrawny twig of a kid that gets bullied in school, it will equalize everyone. Yeah. And what they do, these instructors, these sadistic, I mean, they're, they're obviously <laughs> doing this for a reason, but these sadistic <laughs> they, instructors, yeah. they will try to drown you. And yeah. what they're trying to elicit is a fear response, which will get everyone. And the punchline is that those that panic will often not drown because they're not trying to kill you, of course, but they will get you pretty damn close to it. And you know, a lot of these trainees have to get resuscitated because they like pass out and what have you. But the people that panic perish is the point. Yeah. There's the alliteration of the day. People that panic will perish. Um, and there's there's also another observable situation where you can see this manifest on a maybe not a day to day, but if you ever watch a firefighter enter a building or get out of his truck, even with the building on fire, with people's lives on the line, you will never see them if they're well trained. You will never see them running into the building ever, because there's a saying in the military and other high stakes roles, which is 
slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. And that's, I think, relevant here. Don't panic, yeah. which usually makes people panic. Okay, but don't panic. And that gives the service area to see, to Tyler's point, where there may be opportunity, which is what we're going to talk about today. Any other notes on that yeah. before I, I jump onto this next chunk here no because yeah like i said i could talk about it for hours so you know it's it's a nauseum quite honestly so yeah we'll we'll move along but but people get ready don't panic how about that yeah. that's that's yeah. as much as i'll say yeah yeah make a plan don't panic i like that that's yeah. another alliteration just about ppp okay yeah all right so if we want to seize opportunity in a recessionary environment or a down economy or frame it as you will not a booming bull market like we had for 15, whatever years in the, in the, in the teens, et cetera. Right. Um, there are presumably some out there that are thinking about a career pivot. You know, we just had a show recently with Kim Ladotti, who was talking about the, um, the nursing crisis where nine out of 10 nurses are facing burnout. Half of them are considering yep. pivoting their careers. So certainly we can extend that and assume that there are probably accountants or people that are working at, I don't know, some retail role or something that are considering a career change. And so they're presumably looking at, okay, maybe I'll go back to school and get a four-year degree yep. and study geography like Tyler did. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Right, right. <laughs> or, or, or I could yeah. go to a trade school or how about a beauty trade school? So let's, let's yeah. bifurcate and create two buckets. One is a four-year degree. The other yeah. is a beauty trade school. So talk me through that as a student. What should I be thinking about as I explore these two options here? Yeah, and and just kind of to that point of, hey, during a down economy, what we do see in universities and trade schools is a significant increase in enrollment. In a good economy that we're just kind of kind of still in, but but leaving, in my opinion, and that, again, that's my opinion, it's not factual, you see these uh, universities really struggling to keep their their body counts up, and even us, we we have been doing okay, but um, but not as good as in down economies. So so that's about to happen. You are going to see people at that point where they are fearful for their job, and again, fear and panic. That's not where we make our decisions. That can motivate us to make decisions, but we can't make decisions out of fear, and we can't make decisions in a panic state. So, but what we will see is that people will start making those decisions. What am I going to do? Well, if you have a bachelor's degree, going in and getting an MBA or going and getting uh, a, 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 uh, your law um, degree or whatever it is, that's kind of, not that it's easy, but, but they've made it easier. You can just do that from home, online, on the weekends, whatever. It takes about a year and a half. You can, you can do that. That helps put you up the food chain. But when, when, uh, uh, places are struggling, it doesn't matter where you sit on the food chain sometimes because being higher sometimes is actually a, a liability because they're looking to cut costs at times, some, some industries, right? But you do, I think you have to look at it like, well, I'm just going to go get my college degree without any end goal. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. I think that universities have a tendency, I mean, they are big business. They, they are, uh, uh, they're in it to make a buck. I don't care what they want to say. You, you do have community colleges and that that are running quite lean and really have a uh, laser focus on what they're trying to accomplish. But when the people are entering school saying, okay, I'll just take some living expense money. I'll work a part-time job. I'll go to school. I'll grind this out. And without an end goal of what they want other than a degree, I just, I just am not a fan of that at all. You just wasted time. You incurred a lot of debt. That debt's going to follow you. It doesn't go away in bankruptcy. Uh, the Department of Education is there to take their portion uh, for the rest of your life. And they'll work with you and they'll do those things, but they are going to get paid back. So so without a, a strategic plan, and because you know, when, when you look at for-profit schools like me, we get uh, put into this category that we're bad people, that we're just there to overcharge for an education. Well, I would disagree with that because uh, I've helped and coached people to six figure incomes that when you look at the amount of money that they invested into their education, into my school and the ongoing income that they're receiving, that was the best ROI that they'll ever see in their life. Uh, and so um, we were targeted by the government though, because of some bad actors in the for-profit space 
I'm not going to name names, but you know, you had your, your, your guys out there that, um, that were really muddying the waters for all of us. And so government stepped in and went after us, uh, and, and the universities, they tried to put us all together, but the universities just told them no. And so they, they said, okay, well, we can't touch the universities, but we're going to go after these little mom and pa's. There were over 300 schools throughout the United States in different trades that closed down because of those actions. And those actions weren't 100% bad on their part. They were, they were put into play because of nefarious uh, bad actors that were, that were basically bilking the Department of Education out of money and not providing a great return for the, the person. So someone would go to school, rack up $100,000 in debt come out and be able to get a 10 to $12 an hour job. Well, you didn't need that education to go do that. But universities are equally egregious. There are universities that have degrees that there is no jobs for after kids leave. It's like having a, a honestly, a program that's teaching someone how to run a telegraph. You know, I mean, that, not that they do, but I'm just saying that it's equal to that. There are there are professors, tenured professors, that their hat that they hang on the wall that they're proud of is that they are the foremost expert in Bigfoot. Well, you know, I'm not saying Bigfoot's real or not, but that's a hobby, not a tenured professor. And so that's, you know, those are some of the issues I guess I have. So if, as people are making decisions, um, I would say make a decision based on quickest to market in a marketable skill. Uh, so I sit on a board of directors at the local community college, and it's not about licensure or anything. It's about getting people into the workforce. And mm -hmm. so as I sat down and I said, OK, these are the hot ones right now, but it can pivot at any time. But nursing, as you mentioned, nursing is one of the hot ones. We can get those kids in and out in a program and they're going to be coming out of school at 60, 75, 80, 120 thousand dollars, depending on which market. But but now we're also looking at, OK, where are what's solar ins installation right now? Because solar is a hot topic. And and how do we train someone on going and doing that? Well, they have to be an electrician so we can we can get the initial. OK, under an electrician, if we train these people, we can be 30 plus bucks an hour and we can do that in a four month to six month period of time or construction or plumbing or whatever. So kind of my role is exploring what does tiny homes look like for people. And, and we penciled it out to say, hey, we could train these people to build tiny homes and they should be, at, and it'll pencil at 30 to $35 an hour for them. So, so that's, again, that's a, a, a something that I'm a bigger fan of versus somebody going, because I went to a four year, I'm a college graduate and, and my degree was in geography and Japanese. So I didn't need to spend four years doing that. I'll just tell you that. I could. I should have been a welder. I should have been an electrician. Actually, I would have really preferred to be an auto mechanic. But uh, mm. but and, and, and those are trades. I'll tell you, if those auto mechanic schools uh, or on the job training, again, you're 50 bucks. You could be making 50 bucks an hour. The local, even in small town Idaho, where I'm at, the local guys who really want to get in and turn a wrench, they're a six-figure income. So we overlook that and we say, hey, someone has to go to college to amount to something. No, a uh, six figure income as a barber, six figure income as an esthetician and even seven figure with some of the equipment that you guys promote and some of the services that are a little higher end. I think that, that you know, seven figure income, it doesn't happen without some effort and some vision and some steps. It's not just like snap my fingers and here I go. Um, but but, you know, plumbers, electricians, uh, you know, auto mechanics, construction, uh, framing. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on. And so what we're striving to do in our community is, and, and we've got it buttoned down to where we have a building now, and we can really provide this training. And, and one of them's uh, big uh, machine operators. So they come in and they dig holes and they move dirt and they learn how to do those things in a very short period of time. Now, I'm not going to say universities are a bad way to go. I'm just saying, again, have a vision of what you want to accomplish um, because we need less philosophy majors and more plumbers in the United States of America right now. So if you're like, yeah, I'm just going to go and become a philosopher. Well, what does that even mean? I don't, <laughs> I don't even understand. So again, if, if I'm sitting here saying, 
you know, because people say I, when I'm talking to kids in school, so what are you in? Communications. Okay, so you don't know how to talk to people. I don't know what communications majors, I don't, I don't know what it means. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what jobs they fill. I'm sure that there's something because there sure are a lot of communications majors. Um, but anyway, there's, if it's that you're going back to school to, uh, to secure a better income, and for some people, they're going back to school just to financially make it because they're going to draw from the, uh, the, the living expense money, which isn't a significant amount. I just want to let people know that you're not making thousands of dollars on living expense money to be able to go to school. You're making you know a few hundred bucks maybe a month. But, um, but what is your plan? Because I can tell you, as someone that comes to talk to me or any of the other trade schools in the beauty space, the plan is to get licensed. The plan is to go build your business. The plan is within two years, if you're not at six figures, to reevaluate why that is. And now <clears throat> we look at somebody else. Again, I'm just picking on communication and philosophy majors. You're going to go spend four years eating pizza, getting tattoos and going on spring break to come out and get a $12 an hour job. So someone in the beauty space uh, specifically or any of the trades are going to come in, they're going to earn it. And in two years, so half the time, so you, while you're halfway through school, in two years, they should be at a six-figure income. And what you're going to hear from those people is, no, nah, I don't need my, my food supersized today, just regular, because you're going to be working behind the counter, which there's nothing bad to be said about that. But your degree is not, is not a sustainable degree. Uh, the United States of America is pivoting hard. Uh, there's a housing crisis. There's all these things that are happening that people are looking to become minimalist. People are looking to be able to afford a lifestyle. People are looking to travel. And you don't have to be in a big city to have a high-end job anymore. You can go live in rural wherever. And so you, we need to build communities around that and trades around that. So how do I get someone wired to the internet high speed in backwoods, Montana, the population three, right? And and so anyway, I, I, I'm probably really, again, you get me on a, on a soapbox and I'll just <laughs> go on and on and on without saying much. My caution is because it's going to happen. You are going to see an uptick significantly in master degree programs, in uh, bachelor degree programs and in trade schools. That is going to happen. So if you're in that arena where you're like, you know what, I'm worried about my job. I don't I'm not fulfilled. I'm none of these things. Go and figure out something that would be fulfilling and see what training has to happen. Because if it, the training can happen in three months, there's a lot of upside to that versus four, two, four, or six years. You know, because the, the long-term degrees, um, there are some that are, you're still coming out and you're still doing well, but, but you better have a, an end game in making your decision and pursuing it if you're gonna, end, uh, if you're gonna enter the, the regular academia arena, arena versus going the trade school or certificate route, because I'm a bigger fan of the trade school certificate route, because there is an end goal and a real need uh, in, in that arena. So anyway, again, uh, Austin, I, uh, yeah, sometimes I'll just start talking and I just go, people go, hey, he's making sense. And then it's like, huh, he seems a little crazy to me now. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, no, I think they're, you're, you're hitting on something actually as a macro trend is much bigger. By the way, audience members and listeners, the reason we're talking about this is, again, this is all rooted and oriented around something like optimistic opportunity capture uh, as we're sitting on the precipice of potentially calamity with recession and what have you. So we're looking for ways that we can help you square what you enjoy doing, where you will find meaning in life. Because if you don't have meaning in your life, then you will, you'll be living a meaningless life, frankly. Um, and that's not a pun because it's <laughs> coming from yeah. Victor Frankel. Yeah. Frankly, <laughs> frankly. Anyway, uh -huh. but there's a macro trend uh -huh. here that I think we're, we, we should be thinking about as well. So number one, I can't believe I'm quoting the Bible here on the air, but or the air on this recording. That's great. Let's do it. Proverbs 29, 18. Okay. Where, and this is, by the way, this is like sage advice for any human being ever. I don't care what your religion yeah. is or whatever, where there is no vision, the people perish. So, yeah. so noodle on that. Uh, now there's two other things I, I think are worth mentioning here. Number one is uh, three. Okay. So, the, the planet really is on another precipice of population collapse. So for example, every year from 2011 to 2017, the U.S. grew by only 2 million people. By 2020, it grew by 1.1, about a 40-ish percent reduction. 
Last year, this is a 2021, we only added 393,000 people based on uh, an article from the Atlantic, which may not be exactly true. But if you look at a graph, population rates are declining, aka birth rates, because you need a 2.1 uh, birth rate in a society to sustain the population. What does this mean? Who cares? TLDR Austin. Well, how about this? We also have another crisis of all these plumbers, electricians, estheticians, cosmetologists. A lot of them, I'll say that again, estheticians, cosmetologists, barbers. How about beauty professionals? Yeah. Are boomers, and they're on the precipice of retiring, which yeah. means two things. Number one, if you're young and devoid of capital, get into the industry if that's something that you would enjoy and would find meaningful, et cetera. And number two, there's probably also, in fact, there are certainly also, there's a book called Buy Then Build. Um, there's an opportunity to buy businesses from boomers that are retiring. Yeah. Estheticians, spas, et cetera, because they're wanting to hang up their hats. So there's an opportunity. So the last thing, and then I'll turn it back over to you and then we'll get into, okay, well, what, okay, I'm, I'm sold. I'm in, I'm going to go to session school, or maybe I'm about to graduate, or maybe I'm in the thick of it. And we'll start talking about um, some of the post-graduation success and mental models that we'll get into here in a moment. But the other thing I want to mention, who I got a motor mouth today. The Good. other thing I want to mention is there is an other inroad that is going to intersect at this little beautiful intersection of well, how would I say this? You better be future proof. Here's what it is. There's this little thing called software and software is eating the world. If you want to quote, uh, who was it? The guy from Y Combinator, uh, Paul Graham, I think he wrote about that, that software is eating the world and it's eating your job. At some point it will eat your job. And if you're not yeah. in a creative function or in a constructive construct, uh, const Jeez, Louise, a creative function or constructive function, meaning you're a solar panel ins ins installationist, installationist, installer. Let's try English. Installer, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> An esthetician, a cosmetologist, a barber, something like that. You're probably going to be eaten alive by software and robotics. So you best yeah. be thinking about how can I future proof myself. So there's all these little conflating things. And this is just three of what could be, I'm sure multiple, um, that spell, you better, you better be doing something with your hands that a robot can't do or with your mind yep. that Google can't do. So if you're yep. just a, a knowledge worker that recalls facts, sorry, there's this thing called Watson from IBM. Yep. That's going to make your job obsolete. And you know how you hedge against that. Well, you probably get into the trades and you hang up your, uh, I don't know, American studies degree. So any other yeah, notes on that before yeah. we, we pivot to this post-graduation success stuff? No, I, I think that's, I think that's all spot on stuff. And it is uh, again, coming back to uh, circling back around, don't panic and don't have fear, but have some vision like, uh, you know, Proverbs, let's quote it. Right. I mean, yeah, without, without that vision, you're not, you, you're, you're on a collision course with, with the reality that, because again, there was a time when the telegraph, I kind of brought that up. That was how people communicated long distances. And now we do it through zoom. So the, you know, the telegraph went away and uh, uh, anyway, but yeah, so, so don't panic, don't have fear and, and have some vision and, and you'll be just fine. But those trades that you just mentioned, uh, they can try to put a robot to them. I just don't see that happening because the human element is what are, is why the clients is a big part of why the clients come. So, yep. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, by the way, I'm a philosophy major, LOL. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a geography major. So I think you're one up on me. So there you go. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Uh, that is funny. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. H had I not find found a way to apply some whatever menial degree of thinking prowess that I cultivated in school, which I didn't because it was a joke, yeah. education these days in the universities largely show yeah. up and you get an A. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. with that going off the rails. So I want to get into, okay, so we'll change gears. So now we're, we're shifting from I'm looking for opportunity. I'm maybe I'm trapped in a cubicle. I'm an accountant. I'm doing something menial. I'm fearful that software is going to eat my job. What do I do? And I'm convinced I'm going to go into the trades and I'm convinced I'm going to go into beauty uh, trade, some sort of beauty trade, specifically esthetician, cosmetologist, whatever. Now we're going to say that they're sold in that idea. And we zoom out six months, 12 months, whatever. They've got their degree or their certification or their licensure. 
and they're able to actually practice. Now let's extend this a step further and say that they're entrepreneurial because if they're not and they want to just go work for Massage Envy or some other conglomerate, great, yeah. we'll do that and, and learn, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. But if you want to start your own business because you want to pursue the six, seven figure annual life and income, let's talk about that. Now to set this up, there are two mental models that I want to give the listener. So bear with me as I explain this, because I think this is going to set you up really well to explain. You were alluding to this earlier of beginning with the end in mind. So inversion yep. is one of the mental models. So it's funny that you mentioned that earlier, but I want to start with alloying because I think there are some folks in the audience that are, again, maybe on the precipice of deciding to go to esthetician school, or they're about to graduate. And they're like, oh my gosh, I've wasted all these years being an accountant. <laughs> Ah, contraire, Montclair. So here's a mental model for you that you should be thinking about as you're uh, exiting your training, whatever training that may be, esthetician school or otherwise, or otherwise. Okay, so here's the mental model. Now, by the way, this is from a blog called Farnham Street, Farnham Street, F-A-R-N-U-M Street. It's where Warren Buffett and uh, Charlie Munger, I believe where their Berkshire Hath uh, Hathaway headquarters was or where, whatever, it's, it's some... Warren Buffett thing, Bur uh, Farnham Street yeah. is the blog. First mental model is, and actually Tyler is testament to this, which we'll get to in a second. Alloying. Okay, I, I'll say the mental model again. Alloying. Okay, A-L-L-O-Y-I-N-G. So here's what it is. When we combine various elements, we create new substances. And this is no great surprise. But what can be surprising in the alloying process is that two plus two can equal not just four, but six, seven, eight, 10, 20, 100. The alloy can be far stronger than the simple addition of the underlying elements would lead us to believe. This process leads us to engineer great physical objects, but we may understand many intangibles in the same way. A combination of the right elements in social systems, or even in individuals, can create a two plus two equals six effect similar to alloying. Now, to set this up as another meta point, if you want to dominate and not have competition, one of the ways in which you can do that as an individual is to create a personal monopoly, which is an, uh, an idea from David Perel. And what is that? Well, you take three things that you either are interested in or are, so they might say, Austin, you're loud. Okay, great. That's one of my defining characteristics. Or Austin, yeah. you're too philosophical. Okay, great. Austin, you enjoy selling and whatever. Okay, great. There's my three things. If I alloy them together or listeners, I'm an accountant of 30 years, but I just graduated esthetician school and I'm kind of quirky. Oh, interesting. How about those three <laughs> things become your Venn diagram intersection circle there where you Create your personal monopoly and you share that to the world and you own that radically. And that's what you are. And Tyler is that guy. Here's a guy who studied geography who stumbled into this because his wife said, babe, we're doing this. And he said, yeah, okay, great. Let's go. Yeah, and, let's go. And let's go. And he sees the opportunity, by the way, meta point. But this is uh, the point here is that Tyler is effectively a, a businessman that got into beauty, not really knowing. I mean, you didn't go to barber school when you were 20. No. Here you no. are. You alloyed to your wife, who is a beauty queen that, you know, I don't know if she's like literally a, a beauty pageant queen or whatever, but she's into beauty. You yeah. alloy those two together. Bam. Here we are. Any comments on that before I show the inversion piece to set you up? Yeah. I mean, we never think one person's strength is more important than the other because without her I can't do what I do and without me well maybe sometimes I'm a liability for her but uh but without <laughs> me uh she doesn't the, I mean so we're we are very complementary to each other and uh and and with that we have strengths and there's people that really love us and there's people that don't love us we're not everybody's cup of tea and I'm and I'm perfectly good with that because I'm not going to deviate from who I am and what I'm trying to to, to be so as you're, as you are alloying that, then it is stay true to that. Don't, don't pander to uh, try to attract a group of people that in the end, you're not going to want anyway, but, but it is, I think that's where your strength, if you're quirky, that is a strength. Like I got, 
one of my barbers at uh, the, the name of our shop is called Lyle Amato. Lyle is my grandfather, my dad's first name and my grandfather's first name. And Amato is Mia Garcia, my barber, that we're, we're kind of tied to this thing. Amato is her grandfather's name. So that's where the name Lyle Amato came from. But uh, it, this one little barber in there, she is the shyest thing. Like if you can get two words out of her, you're, you're, that's a great day. But she owns that. So her handle is antisocial barber. And she just blows it up. She just, That's she amazing. just blows. Yeah, she just blows it up. That. She's like, she, she, you're not going to get a great conversation from her. She, yeah. she can't talk, but you're going to get an amazing haircut. But she just owned that. She's just like, you know what? Talking to people is not my thing. I'm going to bring that into my, to your point, into my, one of my modules or whatever you, one of my strengths. And, and so she is the antisocial barber and the girls slam busy and, and live in her dream. She is uh, learning to communicate more as she's going along, but she will always hold true to who she is, which is she doesn't like to talk to people. So she's the antisocial barber. So when she said that to me and she did it because she was so shy, she's like, I just I don't want to talk to people. So I'm just going to tell people I'm not going to talk to them. I was like, all right, Amelia, let's see how this works. Well, it worked. She owned it and it worked. So uh, so anyway, it's interesting that that you say that because because it is, it's just being who you are and being the brand that you want to be and don't pander to people because uh, nowadays people don't want that. They want honesty. They want truth. They want, they want to know who you are and you will build who you are and your brand around that uh, with really, I mean, I'm not going to say no problems with, with effort, right? With, with effort and getting out and making it work. So anyway, just kind of building up a little bit of what you're saying. Uh, at least I believe I am, but, uh, but yeah, it's bringing your, who you are to it and get after it. So because that alloy, because when you were talking about alloy, I'm thinking alloy wheels on, on vehicles, which, which is mm. there the anyway, but, uh, but yeah, that I can, I can definitely see that philosophy. So. Wow. You, you touched on something else that I can't resist. Yeah, let's do it. And then getting your <laughs> thoughts on, I'm a big David Perel fan. Tyler knows this. I sent him a tweet of, of David yesterday, but yeah. David is known online as the writing guy, the online writing guy, whatever. And he has a newsletter. One of his recent newsletters that I, I saw, I think it was two, three weeks ago, or maybe longer, whatever, was uh, a piece on this uh, phenomenon he's observed called the, that he calls the great flattening, where everything is drifting towards this middle ground where it's appealing to no one and, and probably simultaneously repelling almost everyone because it attracts no one. So it, it produces indifference. Now, what am I speaking to to give you guys an anchor to, to visualize? Go look up the corporate Memphis logo. The corporate Memphis logo is a logo that looks very, it's just personality-less. There's no face. It's just a sort of amoeba colors that don't really exist in real life, like purple and like on the people, like their skin tone, it's like, I, I don't, I'm very confused. What? It, so yeah. it's it, the point he's making is that corporations have become boring because they're trying to appeal to everyone. Yeah, and this but... is, I have, Aristotle mentioned this in, uh, you know, back in the stone age or whatever, Aristotle was walking the earth is something to the effect of on friendship. When you try to be some or every, how does he say it? You can't be everything to everyone because you will be yeah. no one to everyone. Yeah. So this gal is she's owning the fact that she is antisocial, which is hysterical because I, I yeah I bet you she actually yeah. does like a few people, but she, she owns does. it and people <laughs> love her and they they're drawn to her. And yeah. So there's it's like this case to be look inward and figure out what the hell you are, what is in your DNA, and own it unabashedly. Because you just doing that elevates you above 80% of the population out of the gate. And you're going to find that as you stand out above the, the I don't want to say the, the bucket of craps, but that's the only uh, analogy or metaphor that comes to mind. Others that are like you are going to look to you and say, oh my God, I want to latch on to that leader that's like me that has the gall to do that. And then yeah. you win a customer for life. And yeah. so part of the reason I do this show is I want to make beauty unboring. And yeah. and sh and give people the courage to go out and say, you know what, I'm a I'm a I'm a weirdo. No, you're not. You're just different. That's cool. And yeah, someone, some yeah, ones yeah. are gonna love the hell out of you for owning that and being authentic to yourself. And in the words of Oscar Wilde, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Yeah, 
yeah. No, that, there's a bunch of amens there. That's what I'll say that, about that. But, <laughs> because because you're right. I mean, I look at big corporation. They pander all the time. If if they view that public opinion thinks X, they are going to talk about X, even if their core value is not X. Yes. Their core value is the dollar, and that's it. Well, that's boring. That is boring. Be bigger than money, but make money. How's that? But yeah. because if if big corporations felt that it behooved their bottom line just to be mean and nasty, they would do it. That would be it. They would just shame people to do it because that's what they view as socially acceptable. That's what they, they're, they're just pandering to the masses. That's what they do. Uh, you know, there's some, there's obviously exceptions to that, but there's definitely a lot of them in there that I just roll my eyes because they did not care about that cause ever until they felt like it mattered you know, to their bottom line. Oh, the people are saying this, so let's pander to them, you know? And yeah, so, yeah. so as you're, as you're doing your brand, because I'm not for everybody in my area, I have four competitors. I do not talk negatively about them. I have a lot of respect for most of them. Oh, well, I have respect for all of them. I like most of them. There's some that on a personal level, we don't jive, but we still have mutual respect. So we're not in, in the business of bashing each other because mm. I can't take on all the business anyway. Like I can't, I have no desire to put them out of business because if they were out of business, then I wouldn't be able to take, I couldn't serve my portion of the populace. I need them in business to serve their portion. Even in our little barbershop, our kids, they're 250 to 300 people is about what they can serve. Once they have their core people, that's their number. They can't serve beyond that because if they did, they would have to work more hours or they'd have to cut corners to get more people in. And we don't, we don't want to cut corners and we don't want to work more hours. So, so there's a finite number of people that they can, that they can serve. So it's like, you don't have to be, you do not have to pander. You just be yourself and you're going to find your tribe and you're going to serve your tribe and your tribe's going to show up uh, in their time frame. If that's one week, two week, three week, four week, you know, whatever their cycle is, they're going to be coming back to you because you're not boring right you you stand for who you are and and you don't you don't have to speak to everybody you just have to speak to your number and that number yeah. on a on a low end in the beauty space on the low end is about 80 and those are clients that are coming back you know with a high frequency to on a high end could be as high as 4 450 and those are a client base that's coming back with with less frequency but they're coming back with religious you know, zeal and this is my time and I will be here in X six weeks or whatever it is. Right. So, so it is, it's, it's um, kind of, I guess, again, speaking a little bit to the alloy theory and everything else, it's, you don't have to be everything to everyone. And if you try, you aren't going to be happy yourself. Uh, and so just because this little girl, I've watched her, she went to our school. I've watched her from the beginning to where she is today and she has grown leaps and bounds, but she's still shy and she just owns it. So here we go. Right. So it just occurred to me why this is a problem. And I never thought of this until literally just a second ago. So thank you for talking me through this. <laughs> <laughs> the reason this is a problem is it's rooted in deceit, meaning it's yes. rooted in incongruency. Meaning, yes. as an example, okay, let's say so one of Artemis's values is be true. Which yeah. means if you are, I don't know, you're in a position where adding cryo skin or endosphere to Plasson does not make any sense, we will tell you this is the wrong product for you. Don't work with us. Don't do it. Go don't go do work it. with this yep. guy or gal because yep. they have the right product for you. Now, I think the reason this is an issue is, to your point, corporations, let's make this more individualized and micro than macro because a lot of our, our, our people are obviously individual practitioners or um, artists, let's say. PMUs in other words. Mm, yeah. If you are antisocial and you score a zero on the extroversion scale, stop trying to be extroverted. That's not you. Oh. It's inauthentic. It's incongruent. And it will eat at you. And you'll face burnout from you, being yeah. disingenuous. Yeah. It'll be painful every day. Every day. You. So yeah. every day. Always tell the truth or at least don't lie. And you yourself are the one that is easiest to lie to in some sense. So be authentic to that, whatever that, that is, which is you. So explore yourself. Maybe that's ask friends. Hey mom, what am I like? I don't know, Austin, you're loud, you're <laughs> noisy, you're difficult to control. You don't really obey <laughs> orders. This is why I got out of the military. 
uh, perfect et cetera. Okay. for the military. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Does respect incompetent authority. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Well, God, we, we have actually not even really gotten to the chunk of the show today, which is post-graduation success. So here's what I'll ask you. Yeah. We can either plow through and continue on, or we could chunk this into a second show. You tell me how much time you have, but we didn't talk about your hard stop time today before we started. Yeah. Uh, my next thing is here in about uh, 40 minutes. So okay. whatever okay. we need to do. I If people even want to listen that long, I mean, that's, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I can talk, like I said, we, I could have talked on the first topic for about an hour and a half. So just because <laughs> I just get going and ranting and sharing life experiences and things like that. So anyway. All right. Well, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. So we'll, we'll plow through yeah, and we'll let's uh, do it. cap at about 40. Now, by the way, Tim Ferriss, his top, I think his, his number one podcast of all time was three hours and 30 minutes with Balaji. Yeah. From yeah. The, the yeah. former CTO of Coinbase. So yeah, I think people like long form. So let's, let's go. Right. go well, go let's grab a, a, a glass of wine. Audience members, buckle in. We're about to get into the real substance of today's show, which is, okay, I'm about to graduate. I want to start a business. What do I do? So Tyler, tell us. Actually, I'm sorry. I need to set you up here again. Because yeah, let's do it. Here's another mental model. You need to begin with the end in mind. Here's the mental model that encapsulates that. It's called inversion. This is, again, from Farnham Street, uh, the blog. If the listener um, wants to go check this out. So here's what inversion is. Inversion is a powerful tool to improve your thinking because it helps you identify and remove obstacles to success. The root of inversion is invert, which means to upend or turn upside down. So as a thinking tool, it means approaching a situation from the opposite end of the natural starting point. And most of us tend to think one way about a problem, forward. However, inversion allows us to flip the problem around and think about it backward. And sometimes it's good, obviously, to start at the beginning, but it can oftentimes be more useful to start at the end. So why am I mentioning this? I just graduated. I'm an esthetician, cosmetologist, barber, whatever. And I want to find the quickest path to get to a seven-figure, let's say six-figure income yeah. a year as a beauty professional. So is there contrarian or what contrarian advice would you give as an anti-guru, not you, but to to to, to go against the, the quote gurus of the space as a starting point uh, as we unpack this here today? Well, I think it starts with what is the experience the client's going to have with you and what is the service that you love doing the most? Because if you love doing lashes, for instance, man, that's a, there is a, we can reverse engineer that all day long. But if you hate lashes, why are you doing lashes, right? So I think that's got to be part of it is what is your niche and where are you going to live? Because at the end of it, about 85 to 90% of your day should live in that service that you love to do. If it's waxing, I mean, there are companies like uh, a Lunchbox, that's all they do is wax. They don't really do anything other than wax. And, and they do really well doing it. So if you love waxing, I don't care what your service that you love to do, if it's lashes, if it's waxing, if it's the the uh the cool sculpt sculpting i mean huge market in that right i mean you guys know that uh, but i'm just kind of listing whatever but it's but then when a client comes what is their experience you know your shop has to be clean your space has to be inviting you better even if you're antisocial you're still going to have to carry on some sort of conversation and connect with somebody and and that, there's a lot more being said uh, in, in action over conversation anyway. So, but it is, for me, it's, it's a two-year game to get to a six figure income. If at the end of six, if at the end of two years, you're not a six figures. Now that being said, I've coached people and they've done it in a year. They were extraordinary people. Uh, they weren't, they were average in terms of, of a person in my opinion, but they were extraordinary in the fact that they were disciplined. That's where they were extraordinary and disciplined. So if they didn't have an appointment, they still were in the shop. They still were there waiting, waiting for the universe to shine on them and send them an appointment because they were available. So it is this, this, you know, I, you have to, the, the end goal, if it is to own your own shop, I don't know that I always agree that a kid coming out of school should open their own shop, but at the same time, most of them are doing that anyway, because they're booth renters, right? They're, that tends to be what's available. 
But if you're going to go take on 2,500 square feet straight out of school, that's a hard nut to cover. So you you better have done reverse engineered. What is that on a daily basis in revenue, either by me or the people working for me or the people I'm renting space to, to be able to cover a nut like that. But but it is, I think, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm getting in the weeds a little bit, but I think in the beginning, the focus has to be on how do I attract the number of people that I need to be busy so that my time is, which is an, a, a commodity as well, so that my time is in demand. Because when my time is in demand, I now am not competing on price, I'm competing on quality. And, and that is, a, there's a mathematical formula to that. If we take the number of days that you want to work in a week, we multiply it by the number of clients that you want to see in a day, and we multiply that by the, the frequency at which clients return with high accuracy. Now, there's some variables that aren't being accounted for, but but we're in the high 97% accurate, I believe. That's the number that you need to be busy all the time. So just to give a quick uh, a deal here. So if you want to work five days a week, you want to see 10 clients a day, and your clients on average come back to you uh, every four weeks, you're in the 200 category because it's five days a week times 10 clients a day. So that's 50 clients a week and you need four weeks of 50 clients. So that puts us in the 200 category. So so these are some of the things that I believe that people need to know coming out of school is, hey, I need to know that my clients are returning to me on a regular basis and, and really build that following. And if you want to be an influencer, that's a whole different deal. But if you're trying to find 200 people, you're Instagram and your Facebook, you don't need millions of people. You know, you need your 200 people in the mix, plus your your grandma and your friends and family and everything else, right? But but now I need to serve those 200 people. And once your time is busy, busy, then I need to start increasing my prices. And and again, there's a there's just a formula to that six figure that, that we need to be seeing on a on an hourly basis. And then my income's coming from the service that they called for additional services that I offer and retail. Those are the three ways in which I can influence my average ticket price or, or on the average, what is a client spending with me? And so then that has to be part of, part of it because our industry does a terrible job on upselling into ad additional add-on services. And we definitely do a terrible job on retail. There's a company called, oh man, who's the big retailer now that I say that? Uh, Ulta. I refer to them as the evil empire. Look at Ulta's numbers. Ulta is just a huge juggernaut in the industry. And all they are is doing what our industry wasn't willing to do, which is retail product. Now, Ulta exists and they're not going away. So now you have to retail product because our industry doesn't want to be pushy. We just want the relationship. We want all that. But we don't want to make our client feel uncomfortable by saying, hey, do you want to buy this? And if the client can't afford it, they don't buy it. These are the things we're thinking. You want to know what's happening? You're not offering it to it. So they walk into Ulta and they buy it there. Ulta doesn't need our help. I think they're a $7 billion a year company and growing when, uh, you know, they're they're just, again, they're a huge juggernaut. My number might be off, but they're more than five. Uh, that, uh, anyway, they that one irritates me because Ulta exists and they are the panderers. They are, that's what they are, but they exist because our interest, industry won't retail product to people mm -hmm. that want pro, want to buy product. So again, I, I know I'm probably in the weeds a little bit on this question, but what does someone coming out of school do? They identify, how do I create lifelong clients? What is my lifelong client number? Where is my time? Because once you're at 50% of your time full in a week, yeah, you could take a little bump. But once you're at 75%, that bump can be a little stronger. Once you're at 100% of your time is booked out, you, you are, you know, now your time is so valuable you can't gouge your clients, but you need to say, hey, I want the right clients. Because sometimes the, the people that are always working you on price and things like that, those are not the right clients. Any, anybody that you have to make special arrangements or special thought to, it's like, okay, well, everybody else, I charge $100 for this service, but for this person, I only charge 50. That's a bad business practice. And then we have to stick to our schedule. So if you're an eight to five person, there are you can do that. If you're a, a, a noon, you like to sleep in and you want to work noon to nine or something like that, it doesn't matter. I don't care. You could be a 3 a.m. To, to 10 p.m. person. You will build your following and you will build your business, but you better stick to your schedule because too many of our people in our industry say, I don't have appointments today and they'll let the people in the shop know, hey, if someone shows up, just text me. I'll be right here. No, 
That's not how the universe works. You're trying to build a number. Your number is your number. And we can mathematically decide what that number is. And if you're not in your shop because you don't have an appointment, that is bad form. You set your working hours, be disciplined and be there. Because again, the kid that did it in a year, and there's only been a handful of kids that have done that, they are in that shop, whether they have an appointment or not, because they set their time and that's when they're there. So mm. realize that you are, pe people want this freedom, which I love that about them, but, but it's not any more freedom than if you had a nine to five job. You still have to show up, you still have to put your time in. But, but the freedom is that you can raise your prices, that you can dictate your mm. hourly income. Because if you're working for a corporation, they're telling you what you are going to make. They're not letting you decide what you're going to make. And tell me how many companies out there, because I know you guys have a pathway to a seven figure income, which is phenomenal, but that does not happen in the first month of being in business. That happens as you create who you are, what you stand for, all these things, offering the right services, using the right machinery, having been trained, being a, being a, uh, a professional. And, and that's a loose term because for one person, a professional is that you are dressed uh, to the nines and you are sharp and, and, and to another person, it's a T-shirt and tattoos and piercings. And they are equally professional, in my opinion. So it's not that one's better than the other. It's just that that you're being authentic. Coming back to your, your point, Austin, you're being authentic to who you are, right? So anyway, these are, and I didn't really, there, there is an actual uh, uh, spelling out of these are the, all the steps that you need to do. And and I, I've got 12 modules that, that me and Austin are talking about getting a little, I mean, I have them in class form, I need to put them into deliverable form to really help people. Because so, as you're coming out, if you aren't business minded, as much as you are craft minded, because one isn't more important than the other. Uh, if, but if you are craft minded only, your pathway to a six figure income and a seven figure income is longer because of that. If you are equally focused on the business and the craft and the service to that client, your pathway gets reduced significantly. I, like I said, I got a kid, came out of school. He was a college graduate, decided he wanted to be a barber, came in at the right time, put his head down, worked. And now he works 40 hours, doesn't work weekends anymore, works 40 hours in a week and is leaving the shop every week with over two grand in his pocket. He's happy as can be. So anyway, I don't know that I'm answering the question correctly again, Austin. I just get going. But, but the new kid out of school, there is hope. There is a pathway for you. And uh, uh, I guess my phone didn't charge. It says I have 10% battery. So we, if I die here, then you know why. So anyway, <laughs> but there is a there is a pathway, but that pathway is all math driven. And I don't care if it's a service. Services are math driven and, and the business is math driven. And if you will get behind both of those, uh, both of those posts, those are going to be anchors in what you're doing. I'm going to provide a great service and I'm, I'm going to be a great business person because um, in our shop, I, we have four rules in, in our shop and I will not create a fifth rule. I told them if, if we can't live by four rules alone, um, then we lack discipline. But rule number one, become a great business person, not good business person, not be a big business person is become a great business person. That's rule number one. And then rule number two is don't steal. Rule number three is be respectful. Rule number four is have fun. And I think that any business in the beauty space can, can live and function and thrive and be be a, a leader in their uh, in their market space on those four rules alone. But the craft is, again, craft and business together are the things that I'm going to say to a recent graduate that you had better be willing to do. And some of the business steps are going to make you feel uncomfortable. Because when I work with people, I say, okay, this is the assignment I'm going to give you today. And you need to go do this. And it like freaks them out. And to me, it's an easy no brainer. But to them, it's taking them outside their comfort zone. Hey, that's not how I do things. Well, yeah, but you also don't make over $2,000 a week. So we got to change that. So, so you know, if you're asking for help, I'm here to support. But if you're not going to make changes, I don't want to work with you. And and typically, they 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 do it. And then it, then once they do it, because they're the ones creating in their own head why they can't do the business. They don't want to focus only over here on the craft side and the making the client feel better and the, the rewards that come from that. But the client wants a better experience and it's done through business as well. So anyway, hopefully I've, I've hit on some of the points. But coming out of school and getting into your first shop, whether you own it or you are working in a facility, 
know that it is not just that service that they called for. There's all these other things that need to be happening for that client to want to come back to you. Because if all you do is the service only without the business steps, you are shortchanging them on their experience and you are not building the relationship that you need to have with that client so that they will come back to you. Because if you're having them for the first time, guess what? Anyone that they went to before didn't do it right because they're now at you. And if you want that to happen and you only want a one hit time with that person, do exactly what everybody else just did for them. So anyway, there you go. I'm sticking to that story. <laughs> I noticed a couple mental models in there. One was alloying your craft with yep. developing business acumen and a commitment to the execution of disciplined business actions like uh, probably tracking the the math of beauty so you need you want to make x amount okay well how many clients is that a month how many a week etc cetera, etc cetera. um well, well i think gosh there's so many things to unpack and yes to the audience we are exploring putting together a more codified um call it course on these topics as well that'll get into this a bit more granularly so stay tuned for that yeah. I think I, I think we should we should touch on because you had a very contrarian view here on this question then uh, for the sake of your phone not dying during the show we'll wrap <laughs> up on the other side of that yeah what is your what is your view on the role of social media and audience building because it's a yeah. contrarian one yeah and 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 I think social media is built for our industry first off but when people want to roll out or when I say people when when coaches and, and companies want to roll out business and then the whole focus is on social media, I don't 100% disagree, but I don't, I'm not all in either. Because if you want to be a, so if you want to be an influencer, that's a different game than if you want to be a service provider. Okay. And, and maybe you want to be both. Um, but my belief, because I have like the antisocial barber girl whose time is, I can show you her schedule. Her time is, is almost 100% booked every single week. She does very few posts. So she's built her business not using social media that, again, is built for our industry. So I think the before and afters have their place. I think quick tutorials have their place. I think creating your clients to, uh, to tag you in their post has its place. If you're an influencer, you know, again, that's a whole different world. That's a lot of work, in my opinion. Everyone thinks that being an influencer, oh, that's easy money. No such thing. No such thing. And and you better have thick skin because people are going to light you up on a regular basis and then people are going to love you too. So if you want to be in an industry where people only love you, well, I don't know what that industry is. So, uh, but, but again, I think social media has, it's definitely has its place, but I watch people uh, that, that I coach and work with uh, individually that don't do anything on social media that have built a very strong business. So I actually encourage them to, to do more posting, but anyway, so I don't know if that's where, we're going with with that uh, uh, comment, but anybody that tells you, okay, we're going to help you build your business, and then the whole focus is on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, or, or whatever it is, I, again, that's not your whole business. That's just a very small module of what what needs to happen on a regular basis. Again, that being said, I have people that are that are really successful that don't do anything, and but I wish they would. At the same time, I wish that they would show their work a little more. And, and engage that way. But that's just not, again, staying authentic to who they are. They're shy. They don't want to be in front. They won't, don't want anyone to know they exist. They just want to come in and do their job and make people happy and walk out with their money. And that's what they want to do. And, and that's what they're doing. But, but I think that their brand would be stronger if they would get in and find the measures that work and, and find the things that work for them and for their client. So wow. what do you think about it, though? Yeah, I, I, again, I don't know that I was going in the right direction for the conversation, but what, what is, what are, what's your input on social media? Because I think it has its place, but I don't think it's the foundation of being successful in this industry. Uh, from the service providers standpoint, anyway. I think the thing people should optimize for initially is finding their first customer. Yeah. Serving them the hell out of them and if yeah. it is the case i don't recall who authored this blog um or article it's it's something like a thousand true fans and i think your your progress yeah. to finding your thousand true fans the idea just simply say that being 
you actually don't need that many people to love you to make a hundred thousand a year. It's a thousand people paying you a hundred dollars a year. That's it. So yeah, that's it. how do you find those thousand folks? Well, it starts with one. Uh, the reason I don't like the idea of, so I'm with you on this, build a big audience is uh, overwhelm, overwhelm, yeah. panic mode, panic mode. We're back to the square one. We're in the pool. We're panicking, yeah. we're drowning. How about we find our first customer? We serve the hell out of them. And we optimize for the delivery of the best customer experience, the best outcome based on what they're after. And then through that, encourage them to send people our way and and have this sort of fractal spidering effect, aka word of mouth, where people are coming to you because you are the best in the business in this sub niche of a sub niche with the uh, specific well thought through delivery mechanism, you're antisocial or whatever the term would be for yeah. that, whoever you are, because yeah. yeah. you are going to be, you know, an, an example of this is you might hate him. You might love him. Who cares? It doesn't really matter, but it illustrates the point is Michael Savage, who is probably the world's greatest radio host because he's just, he is so radically whatever the hell he is that people hate him, which is great for his ratings because then they're giving him attention still and feeding yeah. his viewership and whatever listenership and et cetera. But people also love him because indifference is the enemy. So if you can find ways to avoid indifference, starting with one customer, serving the hell out of them as the parallel that you alloy to that initial idea, that's where it starts, in my opinion. Will you build a big audience? Sure. By the way, there are people with quarter million, 500 million, a million, thousand followers on Instagram that have very little engagement that don't leverage that. Whereas people with 10,000 are making probably more than the big influencers and have higher engagement and thus a stronger affinity from their their base. So I don't think it needs to start big. Again, start small, incrementalize, and find yourself on the path to the, the uh, to accrue the thousand true fans, um, yeah. if that article is is true. So um yeah. Well, look, we we have a dying phone, so yeah. let's let's uh, <laughs> let's hang our hats here today. Tyler, is there anything in closing? Um, we'll give the uh, the listeners a way to connect with you on the other side of this last question here. But if there was any message that you could plug into the jumbotron at the Super Bowl next year, a message to the world of beauty professionals, what would that message read? Well. And I'll say to your point of the swimming pool being the great equalizer, right? Where the big Arnold Schwarzenegger or the little scrappy dude, it's the great equalizer in the beauty spaces as well. So I don't care who you are. You got to show up and you got to get after it. You got to do it right. Because if you don't, you're going to drown just like anybody that panics, right? So there, there is hope. Uh, we have watched uh, kids that have come out of prison, come in and get their life together and nobody Society was never going to give them an opportunity otherwise. They had to be self-made, and they did it. We've watched the single mom that graduated high school in uh, the alternative high school because at age 15, she got knocked up, and that guy that helped in that process was out of the picture. And now here she is, a kid, raising a kid, destined for poverty, but was able to turn it around and now taking that kid to Disneyland and living the dream. Um, we have the, the honor student that, that knew how to play the game that, uh, that, that, you know, so it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, and, and sometimes those kids are the ones that need the most direction to be perfectly honest, mm -hmm. but I don't care who you are. Uh, the, the, the beauty space, if this is the space you want to be, the pool is the great equalizer. So if you don't feel like you're someone that is destined for greatness, get jump in the pool and, and now we're going to equalize things out, but you got to get strong at these two things. And if you do now across the Super Bowl jumbotron, obviously this message is way going way too long. <laughs> but but basically the the beauty space is the great equalizer as well because uh, that I guess that would be my 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 quick little mantra. Uh, but that it, it becomes equalized because if you were in a position to always be in poverty or live paycheck to paycheck, um, then it then it becomes an opportunity for you to really become a high earner. Now, that being said, some of my high earners are broke every Monday. And so we have to have another conversation with them because just because you're a high earner doesn't mean that you're out of poverty, which is, which is stupid to me. It's like, 
because I'm like regularly going, what are you doing? You know, and, and anyway, I mean, there, I have one kid where I'm like, all right, just stop. I'm going to hold all your money and I'm going to pay you because you don't know how to pay yourself. Now they're living large. I'm going to say that they're having a ton of fun. So it's not that they're in poverty, not, you know, wondering how they're going to pay for anything because they always have a way to pay for stuff. But, but this discipline then transfers as you become a high earner, it needs to transfer into how do you manage your money so that you don't always have to work behind the chair. So there's just, mm. they're, they're jump in the pool, the great equalizer. And now how, what type of, of, of thing are you going to build here? And then what's the future so that, that you become uh, an earner, whether you work or not, because if I, if I don't go to work today, I'm still earning my money and, and where other kids, that's not the case. So anyway, that's way too long on a jumbotron at the Super Bowl, but that's, I, I guess that my, my closing marks is coming back to your point of the swimming pool becomes the great equalizer. Well, the beauty, beauty space is a swimming pool. Jump in. Let's go. So let's go distilled. Here's my attempt to paraphrase and it will probably fail, but let's try it. Change of mindset change your direction, change your life. Amen. Beautiful. Let's go. All right, Tyler, yeah. where can the audience connect with you? If they want to find you, chat with so, you or otherwise. Yeah. Look me up, Tyler Price on, uh, I'm more on Facebook. I think I'm on Instagram. I don't know. I'm on LinkedIn. Austin Kate Academy is the name of our uh, cosmetology school in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Um, Lyle Amato Barbershop is the name of our barbershop in it's Ammon, but it's Idaho Falls too. Uh, my phone number, I just throw my phone number out there. It's all over the universe. It's, uh, 208-360-1461. That's calls the cell number that's about to die. My cell phone that's about to die. <laughs> so you have a question or you have a text or whatever. I, like I said, I put that cell number. I plaster that everywhere just cause I don't care. It's like, yeah, people want to contact me. I'm here. If you don't good either way. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the best way to find me through my businesses or through Facebook is probably the better way, but I know I do exist on Instagram. Um, and then that's my cell number. So or Tyler at Austin is my email and Austin Cade is a U S T I N K A D E. And, uh, yeah, I'd love to talk with anybody. Awesome. Well, more to come. There will be more co-creation for the uh, the new Tyler addicts that are uh, obsessed with his ideas. <laughs> Stay tuned, buckle in. There will be more uh, across the horizon coming soon. And with that, let's hang our hats there before your phone perishes because apparently your phone does not have vision. Proverbs yeah. 20, just kidding. Uh, JK. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for being on today. I had a great time. Me too. Thank you. Cheers.